Hello and welcome to another episode of the Jim Powell Report. I'm your host, Jim Powell. And today we have a really interesting show. We have an environmental bounty hunter. Actually, a pollution bounty hunter, William E. Marks. The famous William E. Marks author of Water Voices 1 and 2. And we're going to talk about Andrew Wyeth and remembrances of your time with Andrew Wyeth. And, and it's great to have you on the show here again, William. Hey, great to be back, Jim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I remember uh, when we were on the uh, National Public Radio program for yes, uh, yes. cataloging anecdotal stories of life on the vineyard. Yeah. That was fun. And uh, mm -hmm. you have been out gathering some more stories. And uh, here to share one is a poignant because just recently, the beloved artist Andrew Wyeth passed on January 16th. And so uh, we want to commemorate Andrew Wyeth. And we have an example here of his autobiography mm -hmm. in pictures uh, that uh, we want to talk about but that you have a wonderful connection with Andrew Wyeth that starts way back in the, in the mm -hmm. 70s, yes. back when you were a pollution bounty hunter That's right. in New Jersey. There was yes. an article in the New York Times about this. Yes, a big article in the and New York And a photograph Times. of you with some horses. Yes, a, a photograph of me with horses in traffic um, coming down Broad Street in the city of New Newark. Uh, I used to be the senior environmental analyst for the city of Newark, handling all their water... Uh, public water supply, their water pollution, et cetera, of the confluence of the Hudson and the Passaics. And so when I finished, I left Newark to do the horseback journey, and I went through the city of Newark. I was greeted by the mayor and the head of the DEP for the state, et cetera, on the steps of the city hall that I used to work in. And uh, the, that photograph of me coming down through all the traffic. <laughs> With your hat. It, it, people were yelling hat. out the cars. Yeah, and uh, again, I was in rush hour traffic with my two horses with no police protection. And the horses handled it beautifully. Now, didn't you, yeah. why did they call you a bounty hunter? Well, it's called a pollution bounty hunter because literally uh, I did that for over four years mm -hmm. uh, as a student at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Mm -hmm. I was uh, riding my motorcycle to campus one day and I saw a bunch of dead fish in a river uh, when I was crossing over a bridge. And that led to me investigating the causes of the fish kill. Mm -hmm. and, and this is back in the 70s yes. when the EPA Early was growing 70s. in strength. The Clean Water yeah. Act had just been enacted a few years prior. And it did, and they just um, created the Environmental Protection Agency in mm -hmm. 1970. That was President Nixon by executive order. Mm -hmm. So all this momentum's going on. All this and Earth Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the first one. Yes. I was there. So, you're yeah. um, so, yeah, right, a lot mm -hmm. of momentum. Yep. But no one was doing this type of work of investigating industries. And uh, so it was obvious to me that there was something going on that was wrong politically because the fish kills, the scientists for the local boards and the state kept saying, uh, source of kill unknown, investigation um, could not be completed due to lack of evidence for cause of fish. And this kept happening. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of industry in the area. Mm -hmm. So that led to me um, using uh, my water testing abilities that I had honed when I was an undergraduate and uh, using a camera and going up and down rivers and documenting the sources of the pollution, the illegal sources of pollution. Mm -hmm. And because I knew everyone was corrupt, at least intuitively. Mm -hmm. Intuitively, you had that hunch. I had the hunch. Mm -hmm. But then you started working on the hunch and gathering that evidence. Gathered, well, I, I gathered it um, on, because I went on my own and studied some federal legislation. And there was the old 1899 Refuse Act, and, uh, which had a provision in it for citizens to investigate uh, pollution of navigable waterways. Mm -hmm. And I knocked on the door of the U.S. Attorney's Office in New Jersey, who was Herbert Stern, who had just put the mayor of Newark in jail. Uh, it was Adonisio for corruption. And I knocked on Herb Stern's door 
and said, I'm collecting evidence. <laughs> and he assigned the U.S. Attorney's um, Department that they had for investigating pollution of water, riverways, navigable riverways, which come under the federal jurisdiction. And I worked with them and I collected my evidence and um, they eventually had industries indicted by federal grand juries based on my evidence. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got the moniker of pollution bounty hunter. Pollution bounty hunter. Yes. And so you're going through Newark, yeah. you're on these horses. Yes. And, and your stories are so wonderfully linear and, and then they go off into these different yeah. tangents. You started bumping into people. Yes. Who'd you bump into next? Um, from Newark? Mm -hmm. Well, because of a, a serendipity of a person that lived in my hometown named George Henricks and his wife mm -hmm. in my hometown of Tawako, his brother was Eric Sloan, the famous artist for New England, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, stop in and see my brother Eric, uh, which I did. Eric and Mimi Sloan <coughs> had me as guests on their estate in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Beautiful place. Very beautiful place, and I'm sitting there having a breakfast with Eric and Mimi, and they get a phone call, and Eric is um, leaning back and laughing and talking to this guy named Andy, and then Betsy gets on the phone, and Betsy wants to talk to Mimi, so Mimi's talking with Betsy, and then um, Eric says, oh, he said, we're having breakfast with this fellow who, with long whiskers and bushy curly hair who's riding across the United States on horseback, and he's coming by your way, on his way up to the Canadian border. And he says, oh, all right, here, I'll put him on. And I'm talking to this guy named Andy, uh -huh. all right? And I'm leaning back, and we're joking, and he's asking questions about the horseback journey, which I called Ride for Nature, mm -hmm. uh, because it was an environmental documentary. I still have my diaries. And he said, hey, listen, he said, get my phone number from Eric and Mimi. He says, and call me as you get up near Cushing. He says, I have a big farm, sheep farm, and you and your horses would be welcome to stay as my guest. Mm. Now, I didn't know I was speaking with Andy Wyeth. Mm -hmm. I get off the phone, I hand it back to Eric and Mimi, and then um, after they finished talking, um, he said, uh, do you know who Andy is, this guy Andy? I said, no, he says, he's Andrew Wyeth. I said, the artist? He goes, yes. I said, oh my God. I said, that's wonderful. Uh -huh. And so I did. I hung out with Andy and Betsy and their, their son, Nicky, Nicholas, um, and his wife on their farm up in Cushing, Maine. Mm -hmm. And you got to see him do some painting? I got to see him do painting. Um, as you know, Andrew Wyeth, there's a, I have a photograph of me standing next to Andy we went driving around his farm. His little Jeep. His little Jeep, his uh -huh. four-wheel drive convertible with his <coughs> yellow lab in the car. But I mm -hmm. actually stood next to Andy watching him paint a scene in a field. Mm -hmm. And the curious thing about Andrew Wyeth is that he would not even let his wife watch him paint. She was not allowed to be in his studio. Mm -hmm. Rarely would he allow anyone to photograph him in circumstances around the farm or near his studio. He was very private. Very private. Rarely would he allow anyone watch him paint. <clears throat> and even more rarely, Jim, would he allow anyone to photograph him painting. And I had the opportunity to be with him and to photograph him as he is painting plein air mm -hmm. in a natural setting painting a scene from his farm overlooking the ocean. Mm. And I'm hanging out. Now, we're driving around. The He's up in Maine. Up in Maine on mm -hmm. his farm. And we're bouncing around the field. <laughs> <laughs> and the dog's in the back, the yellow lab. And we're chatting away. And um, he would see something that caught his fancy and stop and paint. Um, philosophizing about life. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that, um, uh, two things that I, really impressed me philosophically was um, he brought up the subject of ego. And he said, um, he said, you know, he said, ego is a very real thing. And I said, what do you mean? He, he says, well, 
he said, everyone has an ego. He said, it's a, real, it's a real part of the human experience. He said, even I have an ego. He said, there was a man that really wanted one of my paintings. And he said, and, uh, well, Andy, you just don't want to give away a painting. He said, no, but this is what happened. He said, this man was collecting art from famous artists, living artists. And he would go and do research on that artist from birth until the present time. And he would put together a beautifully leather-bound book with photographs, news clippings, history about the artist. And he would mail it to the artist as a gift and said, in his letter, when he would mail the letter, he would say, you've impressed me. I wanted to research your life. Please accept this gift. If you feel that you would like to give me something in return, all I request is a small original painting. So Andy sent him a little tiny small original painting. Wow. <laughs> and he said, now he says, William, he said, that man appealed to my <coughs> ego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I learned from Andrew Wyeth was relative to being here and after you die. And he, it, he, this is so beautiful to have this philosophy. He's already, already looking at his death, his forthcoming death, and his legacy. He said, if there's one thing that I want to be remembered for, and he said, I want to be remembered for the way my paintings made people feel, mm -hmm. the way my paintings move people. Mm -hmm. He said, and that is my way of transcending death. Mm -hmm. That was his way of living after he died. A beautiful philosophy, Jim, mm -hmm. and I think it's something that a lot of us should subscribe to. Mm -hmm. Leaving that and passing it on to the and next what generation. You, and what you leave behind as well, Jim. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And something that people will, uh, will see from different perspectives. Each person so looking at a piece of art yes. will, like when you look at uh, Christina's world, Yes. Uh, you don't know that the woman's blind. You don't know that no one's around to help her out. You think they're just maybe they're out of the scene, but or is she crippled, or is she not? How did she get back to the house? You know, all those different feelings um, come through. And mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, Andrew Wyeth went to school at Bates College in Maine, so it's wonderful that he would leave his home in Pennsylvania and go back up to summer in Maine and uh, just reading a little bit of his background. And so now you're up there visiting yes. and this is just all out of serendipity because yes. you started a journey as a pollution bounty hunter in California, is that right? Mm -hmm. Where, San Diego. In San Diego, California. And um, you met a lot of people there that just passed along good feelings to you one of them was Jerry Brown, we were talking Jerry, earlier. Governor Jerry Brown, uh, whom I saw just recently when I was out in L.A. at a party, a fundraiser for Oceana, and Sting and Dustin Hoffman were there performing on stage. So here it is 30 years later. It's 30 years later. Approximately, 30 years approximately. later. And yeah. you've taken the 7,000-mile journey yeah. with horses. Called Ride for Nature. Called Ride for Nature. For water. Mm -hmm. And here I am at a cocktail party. 30 years, more than 30 years later, mm -hmm. with Sting and Dustin Hoffman and a cast of celebrities to, again, in the interest of water. Mm -hmm. And Jerry Brown was a staunch environmentalist when he was a governor mm -hmm. back yes. in uh, 1976 and 77. Mm -hmm. He was dating Linda Ronstadt. And, yes. <laughs> he was. And, he, and Sting the, stays yeah. in Edgartown when he comes. And, and, and here's Jerry Brown mm -hmm. at this party. Mm -hmm. And he and I are chatting away. Uh, and I said, do you remember when you were governor in 1976 about this fellow that took a trek across the United States on horseback? And he goes, geez, he said, I really don't remember. I said, well, I said, you sent me a letter mm -hmm. supporting 
my horseback trek across the United States, but he didn't remember so much the incident of the inception, but the horseback trek received so much national and international publicity, he remembered the horseback trek. Oh, yeah. You were in the New York Times? A UPI, AP, yeah. national television. Yeah, Times. it was so, fun. Yeah. And so you were building awareness, and uh, so you get up to Maine, there's Andrew Wyeth, and... Um, uh, I want to get back to his life and the beauty of his paintings and his legacy that he passed on. I wish that we could take a look, at, and I want people to go to their own local libraries and bookstores and pick up a copy of Andrew Wyeth's autobiography and yeah, look at the good. beautiful paintings that he did. They're so, I want to say, simplistic and mm -hmm. natural. Um, they're all... I want to say landscapes are natural scenes, but yes. with incredible detail and simplicity of seeing a man leaning on a scythe or, or someone just like Christina's were out in the field or, or the view from the top floor of the house in Maine looking at where the 17th, um, 18th century home, yes. homestead that he built, looking out over the pond on the peninsula. And um, that type of attention to detail Yes. Is the message that mm -hmm. probably he was trying to pass on to us to see if we could see life with the same detail that he does. Uh, or good, that he did. Uh, an excellent point, Jim. And I also liked his um, painting of his son Jamie uh, called Far Away, where Jamie is sitting with a um, coon hat in a oh, field. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I thought it was a great portrait of Jamie as a young boy and um, Jamie fantasizing um, being perhaps Daniel Boone. Yes. Um, and his history, N.C. Wyeth, of course, uh, kind of a cowboy type character mm -hmm. in full regalia many times. But uh, relative to the subjectivity of our perceiving and appreciating his artwork, of course, it's an individual resonance with the paintings. But when I was with him, Jim, and in, he was doing the painting, there is a scene um, uh, that uh, a photograph, uh, I took several there, but um, when he's concentrating and he's focused and he's painting, and what he's painting is, it was a scene, the field went down and there was a clump of trees and then there was an opening in the trees and you could see the ocean. And a sailboat was tacking back and forth in the scene and then went into the trees. And Andy is painting and I didn't say a word the entire time during this because I, I knew he was locked in. I wasn't even there in his mind. Mm -hmm. That was obvious. Mm -hmm. And he's painting, and he's painting, and he's looking, and he's painting. And he goes like this, and then he stands up because his vehicle has a little bumper for his feet to rest on. And that's obvious in the photograph. When you look at the photograph that I have here for this conversation, mm -hmm. he would stand up. He, he took his pad, dropped it on the ground, stood up on the hood of his, stood up on the bumper, bumper and looked down at it, turned around, grabbed a paintbrush, and mixed some of the watercolors on the hood of his Jeep. Mixing them together wildly, looks back, drops off the bumper onto the ground on his hands and knees, and he's making an addition to the painting. Wow. <laughs> totally. In fact, when I first met him at the farm, I was sitting in the main house at the dining room table mm -hmm. with Betsy, and we're chatting away, and I'm having some tea. Mm -hmm. And after a while, in walks Andy. Now, he has this um, wool, narrow-type narrow jacket on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... What's sticking out of the jacket is, it's, it has some burrs, cacti burrs, mm -hmm. and some pieces of brush. He had obviously been rolling around on the ground somewhere. Mm -hmm. To get his perspective. God knows what he was doing, uh -huh. or if he was laying on his back. I have no, no clue, but when I first met him, he walked in, he was all rumbled, 
and had all kinds of stuff clinging to his jacket from just coming out from back from some adventure. Uh -huh. Some of the best artists I've seen that, that remind me of, of that. Um, Anne McGee, when I see her yeah. up in Menemsha, mm -hmm. she'll be covered from head to toe with a big hat and, and um, whatever is around that she's been laying in so she can get a, a painting just right. She'll have clay or whatever, sand. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that's and so do you, true. Do you paint? I don't paint. Okay. But, um, but I've been out photographing people. I've done a calendar and different things. But okay. um, it's wonderful to, to get to know the personality of these people. What else is Andrew Wyeth like? What, what can you remember about your conversation with him? Was he soft spoken? Uh, very he... soft spoken. Sounds like he's very introspective, obviously. Very introspective. Talking about ego. Very and... introspective. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it was only because of his recent death that I shared those photographs uh, with other people. Mm -hmm. And one of the conversations we had, because I knew that he was reclusive. I knew that he was very private and he cherished his privacy. And that was very vital to him for the muse to flow and for him to create. He needed that space between him and the rest of the world. His own bubble that he lived in as an artist and he was very particular as to who entered that bubble. Mm -hmm. I felt so honored to be there that I had to ask this question. After I took the photographs, and just prior, to, just when we were pulling up in the Jeep, I said, may I photograph you while you're painting? And he said, yes. Mm. So we're driving back to the main house, and he, uh, he's kind of humming to himself. And I said, Andy, um, can I ask you this question? And he goes, ask me any question. I said, I feel really honored that um, you and your family have given me this access. I said, but can I ask you why um, you allow me to photograph you as you're painting and photograph myself standing next to you as you're painting? I said, you know, I know this is something that you rarely allow anyone to do. Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, he said, William, he said, to be honest with you, he said, I can tell that I can trust you. Mm -hmm. He said, and I know that you will never use those photographs in any way that would hurt me or my family. Mm -hmm. Looking me right in the eyes. Mm -hmm. And I felt chills going up and down my body that that was coming from Andrew Wyeth, mm -hmm. but that it was so, oh, the honor, yeah. but also that mm -hmm. in his filtering process, that from our first meeting, when he first walked in the door, that I had somehow or other worked my way through his filters to where he dropped his guard down and was himself. Mm -hmm. and, and you get to see him in his creative prowess. In his creative prowess, being himself, mm -hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> and being free to be himself, and know that I would not be judgmental and that I, was, I too was being myself. I was so extremely grounded at that time from the horseback journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of feel that he picked up on that as well. And it's an, another thing that he finished when I was there, he finished a painting of a young man with a beard, with a cap on, inside a house, a lighthouse that was brick lined looking out a window with mullions and you could see the ocean, just a hint of the ocean in the distance. Now he finished that painting while I was there. It's a blonde haired guy. Mm -hmm. A young guy. Young guy mm -hmm. with beard just like mine, mm -hmm. looking out to sea from the inside of a lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And it was almost as though he could see the future, if in fact that is me, or the, the coincidence, um, or the synergy of the moment, um, whatever may have been the confluence at that time, 
But here it is 30 years later, I'm standing inside the Gay Head Lighthouse, lighthouse that I saved from being torn down mm -hmm. in the mid-1980s. Yes. Looking mm -hmm. out that window on the second floor. I know what you're talking about, yeah. Brick-lined, mm -hmm. mullions, looking out towards sea. Mm -hmm. And almost as though there was something forecasting in the future, the prescient, uh, prescience of that moment was very profound. Mm -hmm. And I felt that. Do you think that Andrew Wyeth, yes. when he put his brush to canvas, made an image, he made an actual portal, and that he could view his life through the people that were looking into that image that he had just painted, and that when he saw you come, that you had been coming on a journey, and that you were just off the next canvas, just out of range, but that whatever else he was painting, it was that blonde b uh, boy that was looking at the lighthouse, that he felt and could communicate you know, that. And, and that's why you felt to him that you were worthy to come into his world, into his canvas, to be one of his subjects, maybe for a future painting or something. Well, um, that's an excellent and a transcending thought. Mm -hmm. And on that note, to segue, Jim, mm -hmm. when he was doing the painting in the field of the ocean scene, remember I was telling, talking about the sailboat that yes. was tacking back mm -hmm. and forth, and the sailboat mm -hmm. disappeared. Yeah, where'd it go? Okay, now he finishes the painting, and I'm standing there next to him, and he's on the hood of his Jeep, and I'm saying, geez, Andy, I thought for sure the sailboat would be in the scene. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, that's right. People always love to put boats. Boats. In I said, I'm surprised you didn't put that uh, the sailboat in the scene. And he goes, oh, the sailboat's in there. I go, it is. He goes, yeah. He says, take a look. So I was looking. I was thinking maybe uh, there'd be a hint of the stern in the trees, or the mast, or maybe the, the little the top of the mast. There'd be something in the trees. And I'm looking. I can't see the sailboat, Jim. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, Andy. I said, I cannot see the sailboat. And he said, well, it's there. He said, you see this little undulating, undulating line here? In the water. In the water. <laughs> <laughs> the tack, the tack goes, line. He goes, he yeah. goes, but it wasn't obvious. Mm -hmm. It was very subtle. He was so subtle. And he said, to be honest with you, he said, most people who look at this painting will not know that that came from the wake of a sailboat. He said, but other people will see those white lines, and they'll wonder why they're there. Mm -hmm. He said, and the only person who really knows, he said, besides you and me right now, he said, is just us as to what those white uh -huh. pieces of oil are in the painting. Yes. So he, you're right, in a way, he was lo looking into the future, Jim, mm -hmm. as to how people would look at his painting, mm -hmm. how it would resonate with them, and what they would be thinking. So you were very astute mm -hmm. to pick that up. Did you read that somewhere? No. That was a, an observation of your mm -hmm. own, yeah. extremely intuitive <laughs> of you, because that is precisely where the man's mind was. Mm -hmm. wow. And the fact that he anticipated people looking at his paintings and that giving him immortality mm -hmm. was that. very important in his mind as well, Jim. Wow, that's, that's great. Yeah. William, I wish we could talk longer as we're uh, Thank you. commemorating the life of yes. Andrew Wyeth yes. and your connection to him on your starting out on your journey. And, uh, but we want to commemorate the, uh, the life and celebrate that. The passing of Andrew Wyeth, famous American artist. He died on January 16, 2009 at the age of 91. And uh, we want to thank you for being on our show today, William. Again, Great pleasure, Jim. to see you. There'll be other things Good we'll to talk see about you. in the future. Yes, thank you. And I want to thank you, our viewers, for watching today. And thanks to our sponsors. Thanks to Humphrey's Bakery for helping support <laughs> us here. And uh, I want to thank you for watching. And please give me a call, 696-1959. That's 508-696-1959. And let me know what you think of the show. Maybe you can be on the show sometime yourself. Anyways, thank you very much. We'll see you again soon.